we shall be discussing. Just a reminder that uh, this is Morning at NTV. You can be part of the conversation on our socials. That's Twitter, Facebook, and of course, uh, we are streaming live on YouTube. You could also be a part of this conversation by sharing your views on the topics that we do discuss. We shall be emboldened by your perspective on the issues of the day. And just, you never know what you say and share could be able to help in shaping the direction the country could be taking. We are told that the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Finance, uh, Ramadan Gobi, is big on Twitter, and of course uh, one who takes uh, that feedback very importantly. We are discussing the rising fuel prices in Uganda and of course across the globe and how that the transformation of the economy that uh, the president and many other stakeholders uh, have been uh, uh, touting. Uh, joining me for the discussion is uh, Dean Emanuel Chisembo, the executive director at Health Watch Uganda. He's also an official at uh, Bunyoro Kitara Youth Initiative for Development. He will be taking us uh, through uh, some of the activities that are being rolled out in that region with regard to empowerment of youth to be actors in economic uh, transformation. We are also joined by user suspect and uh, known economist at uh, Makere University Business School, Mr. Mhire. A very warm welcome to the program. Thank you. How are Thank you doing you. today? Not bad, not bad. Not surviving. Bad. So You're surviving? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I ask you, how are you doing? Because many Ugandans are grappling with a lot of issues, including the fuel prices that has uh, translated into high cost of uh, foodstuffs because uh, uh, fuel, especially diesel, forms the bedrock of uh, most of these uh, logistical, uh, especially the transport aspects in terms of bringing much of the food uh, from uh, the uh, produce centers uh, to the markets and of course there's a lot that is going on we shall be delving a lot into that uh, many thanks for joining us too uh, Mr. Kisebo first take us through what Health Watch Uganda is and uh, the Bunyoro Kitara uh, Youth Initiative for Economic Development yeah uh, thank you very much and of course uh, our viewers uh, Health Watch Uganda mm. is one of the organizations that have come up to advocate for health rights. That's right. You have seen it uh, in uh, uh, Nodig syndrome, mm. that is the northern uh, region. Then also here when people were being evicted from Bukasa inland port, mm. you saw it come in. So it does uh, that kind of work in terms of advocating people's rights. And of course, uh, th for those people who may not uh, afford uh, to actually raise uh, those legal fees. It is very, very good at that. Mm. Then the Bunyoro Kitara Youth Initiative for Development uh, basically empowering youth on how they can really uh, start with these small scale businesses and uh, of course get to uh, to that large scale business, mm. uh, more so in agriculture. That is where we are right now. Okay, that's uh, very uh, interesting there. Have you been brought on board uh, with regard to the rollout of the parish uh, development model by the government? Yeah, uh, of course the whole country mm. is uh, undertaking the same. But of course uh, our parish model, uh, uh, the parish model funds which have come up, it is not the first time that these good programs are coming up. Mm. Like government, you know very well it has had in Tandikwa, Operation Wealth Creation. Mm. But we need to review, has it achieved anything? Mm. Uh, yes, you may come up, you package it, uh, a well laid bed, but when under, they are thorns. Mm. So we want to see, uh, before we go to polish model funds, how about these other good programs that have been coming? What happened to them? Why don't we again maybe strengthen them? Mm. Eh? We should look at uh, uh, dangers or the threats uh, that pose threats uh, to uh, these because I'm already getting I I issues that out of 17 million, I think these people are getting over 14 million. Mm. So w where is the balance? Where is the balance going? So that this takes us again now to corruption. Uh, to corruption, and uh, I think there is much uh, to be done in terms of fighting corruption in this country. Okay. But however, uh, we need to know, because uh, 
uh, Uganda has come from very far. Uh, that, about, that is about in 1986 yeah. when President Museveni came into power. I think uh, Uganda was highly indebted and uh, there was a lot of inflation and of course uh, uh, we are going back to square one because right now you are getting 100 shillings, 200 shillings, mm. 500 shillings. He's no longer doing anything, even 1,000. Mm. When you go to a supermarket, when you have 50,000, you get small, small items. Mm. So meaning that we are going back to square one. So when uh, uh, President Museveni came, by that time I remember uh, he bought even a bed around Vice. And his ministers were driving these Nissan Rollins, which were very, very cheap mm. in terms of uh, uh, administration. And of course, uh, this was a, a clear signal mm. that uh, he was working for the people. But right now, uh, <laughs> when you look at uh, the when you look at uh, the recommendations mm. of IMF and uh, World Bank, it advised that there should be devaluation of money. Mm. That's where you saw that every money that you had was being cut or reduced by 30 percent, mm. such that we could fight this kind of inflation. That was now a recommendation from IMF. Then two, it was about privatization. Mm. Privatization like selling off these uh, uh, national bodies like the UTC, the Uganda Transport uh, uh, company. company. Right now, again, you are seeing taxis, uh, border borders anywhere. So they didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. They didn't do very well under that kind of arrangement. Okay. Then the other issue was about decentraliz decentralization. Mm -hmm. Decentralization which has worked okay politically and socially. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it economically, you find that it has not worked. Like districts are getting a lot of problems. Uh, you can look at, uh, like me, I come from Kagadi. Mm. If we have any disaster like floods or famine or locusts, you find that the districts are not empowered. Mm -hmm. They don't have emergency funds mm. that they can handle that. They continue coming to the central government and uh, you find all that is a mess. Then um, the other issue yeah, is quickly. about to... Uh, uh, the it advised about the small uh, public, uh, uh, small public effectiveness and mm. the small unit army, mm. such that it could help. But right now, you find that uh, there is a, a, a very very large army. You find the 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 public sector is very wide mm. because of this creation of these districts. Uh, you find the RDCs, the LOC fives. You find that. Uh, uh, there is a lot of money There's going into that. Going so into if that. we okay. would reduce mm. to a small effective army and of course public um, uh, service which is very, very effective, then automatically we would be going somewhere. Okay, that's a very good perspective there and gives us uh, a very uh, uh, good understanding of where we're coming from and uh, just about how we can map the way forward. Uh, he spoke about the fact that uh, in 1986 inflation levels were high. Right now we are seeing the same script playing out. Uh, inflation is now past six uh, percent and of course uh, fears are that it could peak anywhere between uh, uh, January or February. When you look at the rising inflation this is uh, a trajectory that has been well predictable for the last uh, six months or so. Uganda is grappling with just about the same problems that every other country is grappling with. However within these other countries we are seeing measures that are being rolled out publicly and uh, presidents and ministers and government officials coming out to announce that this is being done to ensure that the people can be able to ease through the economic times now. In Uganda, the script is different. We are told, please, pass via, endure, and do the best you can do in order to be frugal. Of course, it's a question that has been asked now and again, but we shall again interrogate it further. Are we on the right track when it comes to how we are tackling this particular economic crisis? Um, thank you. Uh, just as you put it, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, it's a global challenge mm. right now. But uh, one thing we need to note is that the kind of inflation that other countries talk of US or UK is, mm. is facing, we are facing a different inflation. Dif inflation is a very wide, you know, yeah. uh, field and we have so many types. 
Uh, and when you come to Uganda, the type of inflation we are, we are facing today is structural inflation and imported inflation. Okay. Not what other countries are facing. Mm -hmm. uh, the factors that contribute to this kind of inflation might be common with those other economies, but mm -hmm. what we are facing is slightly different. So um, what should the government do in this case? You know, as you put it, when you come to Uganda, um, the government here has always tried to do uh, what we call do-nothing approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some of the economists will come up and say, do this, do that, and they're saying, no, we can't tamper with, uh, mm -hmm. for example, tax reduction in the temporary or short term. Mm -hmm. We cannot do uh, subsidies. But you see, where we are heading, you know, uh, this is not something that is going to happen for a month or two months. Where we are heading, they might actually end up actually doing what we've been telling them. So when you have structural inflation and you have imported inflation, what does this tell you, you know? that it's high time you think of you know, boosting your domestic production. Because mm. Uganda as a country, we are importing almost everything, even things we are capable of producing from here. You know, when you look at our um, balance of payment, you know, there is a deficit of about 2.6 billion ASO dollars. You know, our exports are starting at 7.6 billion, while our imports are starting at 5.5 uh, 5 .5 billion ASO dollars. So, we are importing even things we are able to produce from here. Because uh, when you look at the entrepreneurial environment here, you know, you look at the cost of credit is extremely high. Mm -hmm. Now, when you talk of inflation, inflation affects mostly those that are on the low scale of income earning. And that's where we are saying that most of Ugandans have been pushed into extreme poverty and vulnerability because, one, of course, because of the pandemic that is going on, it is not yet over, it is still here. Mm -hmm. And of course, other external shocks uh, like the, 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 the war in Ukraine. So, you know, there is much for the government to do. Uh, while we are talking about all these issues, here we are in a middle income economy, politically and statistically. But in reality, <laughs> Ugandans, when they stages. check into their pockets, deep mm. into their pockets, all they can feel is extreme top shelf poverty oh. so that's here that's where we are so um some people actually a small section of uganda who cannot even make one percent of population of this country oh. they're even beyond middle income they are even above it yeah, but we're talking it. about the majority and these are the people that are highly affected by inflation mm -hmm. you know he has talked about you know uh, prices uh, fuel prices you're talking about a liter today, it is around 600, uh, 6,200 6, shillings. An increase in fuel price triggers prices in, in all other goods oh. and services. So, uh, elections are coming in Kenya. Mm. They, they, are, they, are, they are coming. 9th August, August, the election yes. will be. Uh, and you down. know, whenever there are elections in, in Kenya, you know what mm. happens with fuel you know, prices. You know, we might see fuel prices going as high as even 10,000. I want to ask you, or challenge, you go and ask the government if there's any plan. They know every time the elections in Kenya, fuel prices will always increase. Mm. We have how many months to go? Just one. Go and ask them if there's any plan they have. Usual, they will use their usual, uh, usual approach, which is do nothing approach. So that's bad, you know, how bad we are doing. But let me just uh, uh, delve a little bit deeper into that. Uh, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance, who is also uh, Secretary to the Treasury, uh, Ramadan Gobi, has said that sub the subsidies cannot work. And uh, it is not economically viable to undertake such an approach in solving many of the problems that we find ourselves in. He has also opined that in doing so, we could be emboldening or enriching a group of Ugandans who are so rich that they take on uh, obscene economies of scale when it comes to some of these uh, particular issues. You are an economist and uh, one that is uh, uh, grounded at Makere University Business School. He is a former lecturer at Makere University Business School. Is this economics that works? Uh, well, um, I think uh, uh, the permanent sec secretary has made uh, statements, uh, uh, you know, like, for example, agriculture is not that important. Mm. Uh, so when he tells me that subsidies are not important at this point in time, I mean, what can I say? That is his own way of looking at things. Mm. But I can tell you that uh, if you call that the economics that works, for me, I call it economics that doesn't work. Mm. And as, uh, as I've told, where we are heading, 
those subsidies will have to come in, most especially about fuel. Mm. If you can see the impact of you know increase in fuel prices, mm. how much they affect all the, the, the commodities. Talk about the inflation. When you look at the basket of goods that are, that are captured for this kind of inflation, now the, the inflation is spreading even to other goods. Mm. And all this is because of actually this increase in price, mm. uh, price for fuel. So for me, it is economics that doesn't work. Okay, for the youth in the country, you find that uh, most of us, I would say us, but uh, statistically, <laughs> I'm not a youth. <laughs> I've okay. transitioned past <laughs> the age of 35. But uh, you work with an initiative yeah. that is targeting youth and activities that are aim aimed at helping them, well, be empowered, but most importantly, be the drivers of the kind of transformation that we are looking at. Now that this is going on, they've been heavily affected. For example, the ability to simply afford bread. Eh? I don't know how you are approaching this particular challenge. Are there initiatives away from anything that government is rolling out that have helped these youth, uh, first and foremost, find sustainable ways of earning, but also do works that help the broader community in terms of uh, uh, triggering a bit of economic, uh, economic activity here and there? Yeah, one thing you should know I will give you an example that is where I come from in Bunyoro. Mm. Uh, when you look at Bunyoro and Uganda at large, you find that uh, agriculture is everything. So when if agriculture is everything or the backbone of Uganda, and you know what is agriculture, you need to have land. Mm. So when you look at Bunyoro particularly, we have issues on land like in Kagadi, you have mm -hmm. Thomas in Kagadi, in Bulisa, in Changwari, in Kiriandongo. And I'm coming into that perspective of youth initiative development mm. and where the youth can really help themselves to that is uh, actually start something small. It is in terms of agriculture. Mm. So if land is not there, then automatically the whole process is doomed. Mm. So I would like government to come up mm -hmm. because our land in Ibunyoro, actually people on that land, they don't have any legal uh, capacity. They cannot resist any eviction that comes. There are no ownership. Uh, yeah, ownership. there is no ownership. Not even traditional or communal. Nothing at all. Any person at any time can evict you. And you are supposed to depend on what? On agriculture. Mm. So the land in Ibunyoro should actually, government should actually uh, come up with a violent hand eh? and again give it back to the community because right now you find a person is holding like seven villages, has a title. You wonder how did this person get this title? Can you say that again? I'm saying a single individual. Yes, a single individual holds the title for seven, seven villages. villages. How big are these villages? They are too big. Uh, tell us. And you wonder. We have an issue here in uh, in in in, in, in Hoima, mm. where there is a, this Hoima sugar factory. You have seen this in Kiriandongo, where there are three sugar factories in Kiriandongo. These people were evicted. Mm. In and other words, was, the, the companies or establishments, including the sugar factories, have taken no, okay. large states Ex of land. Establishing them, we would not have worries. Mm. But the procedure, these people were not duly compensated. Mm. They were just uh, evicted. And right now, they are refugees in their own country. They have nowhere to stay. So all of these mm. can affect the economy of Uganda. Okay. It can affect the economy of Uganda, and you know very well the economy of Uganda minus agriculture, it is nowhere. It is nowhere. So government should really come in with a, a, a very radical hand to these people, some of these wealthy politicians and businessmen who have collived with the district chairpersons, with the area land committees, the RDCs, some of these RDCs, the DISOs. Mm. 
to come up with these fake fake land titles. You are, are come leading up with. an initiative. Yeah. Bunyoro Kitara. That is one of our you biggest problems. What are you doing in terms of uh, petitioning? I have the, done that. Give us an example. Where, I have how done far that. Are you with the, any petition that you? No, I have done that. Have you named names? I have uh, done it here in Ibukasa in Kampala mm. when the government threatened, gave them 21 days mm. to evict this Ibukasa inland port. Mm -hmm. I did it and I successfully got permanent injunctions. And these people were already there okay. in compartment 7, 8, 3, you know it. Then uh, I wrote also uh, to the concerned people in the government over this issue in Chiangwari because mm. that is actually the worst place right now as we talk in Ebunyoro. Okay, now uh, I'm afraid uh, the, that is uh, a topic that is uh, a little bit uh, into uh, something that uh, is we could tackle on pretty much another day. I just wanted a bit of uh, specifics on who owns land or which particular, but I know it could be a very... Uh, no, there is a recent one. This a one tight, of... Uh, a tight, a tight the, there is walk. a recent one. The mm. one of uh, the one of the man complaining uh, to be the owner of some land in uh, Chabisangazi, mm. that is in Chigorobia. This Agaba mm. has evicted over 500 families. Okay. These families have nowhere to stay. And the government is just looking on. All right. One thing I, I'm sure of is that uh, that particular concern has been had. Uh, Mr. Francis Mahiri, just help me understand the aspect of uh, mass production as one that can uh, trigger <laughs> the kind of, uh, you know, a rollout of uh, aggregate demand to be able to allow people to spend a little bit more on goods that are first and foremost available. Because availability is one thing. Many Ugandans want the goods or foods that are in the country, but not within the locality where they are. So much so that it's an embarrassment. We find that in one part of Uganda, we don't have a certain food, uh, certain foodstuffs, yet they, these foodstuffs are abundant in other areas. One could say that is down to the fact that logistical aspects, including transport, are to blame. Mass production as a strategy to help us get out of our uh, well turmoil, uh, crisis? How is it possible, especially right now, that we find ourselves you know, trying out just about everything to get out of this situation? Um, of course, when you talk about you know, some parts of the country that are having you know, a certain uh, products in abundance and others mm. have scarce, scarce, uh, scarce you know, facing scarcity, you know, uh, the markets always respond. Mm. You know, as a businessman, even if I'm a middleman, if I know that, for example, something is lacking in Kabale and it is in abundance uh, in Soroti, mm -hmm. as a businessman, that I get a signal from the market mm -hmm. and I have to go and take it there. But, you know, you're going to find that now the issue is to do with fuel prices, meaning that the prices are going to be high. And yet, you know, at the same time, the population, you know, uh, they cannot spend. The purchasing power is completely very low. Mm. So those are the challenges we are talking about. You know, when we talk, when uh, when we are talking about economic growth, you know, you look at um, you look at investment mm. and consumption. consumption. Investment without consumption does not make sense. You know, investment is coming from uh, uh, from supply, mm. and consumption is coming from uh, demand. So you need to balance the two. So um, so why? Do you think, uh, for example, as we talk of today, we still import things we can't even import, you know, we can actually Manufacture produce locally? Yeah. This is because of the poor um, uh, government policies, you know, uh, uh, policies. And the main reason is that, you know, when you come to our country here, politics and imagination has surpassed economics. Politics and imagination, and imagination has, has surpassed, surpassed economics. economics. Explain so that. It's, it's all about politics first. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's all about politics first. I will tell you, for example, we've just had, you know, we've just started the, the new financial year. Mm -hmm. Look at the budget allocation of resources. You know, uh, you're looking at um, a debt repayment, you know, a security, taking the biggest lion's share. Mm -hmm. And when you talk of, of production or increase in economic growth, you know, you need to focus on things that are important. One, is human capital development mm. because um, you know it's it's it you need to have that knowledge, technology, and innovation mm. production led. 
and that means that we have to support in human capital. Human capital but we've program. seen government going big now, on uh, human capital development, at all, and, uh, at all. rolling out initiative after initiative. Whether it's succeeding or not, perhaps could be a debate we can, uh, you know. That's uh, that's where I'm going. Up. I'm going to break mm -hmm. it down for you. When yeah. you talk of human capital development, you're looking at two sectors mm. mainly. You're looking at health and education, mm. and of course now we have added other items like gender and gender. then the parish development model. So let's start with education. What is happening in the education sector? Teachers are on strike. Why are they on strike? They want increase in, the, in salary, especially the, the, arts, the, arts, uh, the teachers. arts teachers. But even if you increase the salary, what is beyond that? The environment. Mm. You know, are they well equipped? You, for example, increased increase the salary for science teachers. But are they well equipped? Let's say talk about the laboratory and other mm. things they need to use. How come that the sector, for example, all the graduates, all they want is to go uh, you know, outside the country looking for greener pastures. Mm. And they are now, you know, uh, you know, they are now sponsoring themselves to go into modern day slavery in Arab countries because of the kind of the quality of education you're giving. Teachers are not motivated, but even the, the environment they are working in is not well equipped. So we have to stop imagining, but start doing the real things. Mm. When you look at the economy, when you look at the economy, a lot of things have gone wrong. You know, he has talked about the debt uh, that this government uh, inherited, the big debt. In fact, in 1986, uh, the, this government inherited about 1.5 billion mm. dollars in debt. As I speak today, it has more than, you know, uh, 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 if you look at the, it has more than multiplied by over 10, uh, over 10 times. You know, so mm. what are we spending on? You know, we are our current debt is 7.73 7 7 trillion. trillion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So meaning that almost every Ugandan is indebted, you know, by over 1.5 million Ugandan shillings. So we have overboard. Mm. We have overboard to the extent that even how much we are borrowing today is actually, um, is actually making our shilling appreciate. Now, when our shilling appreciates, because you're bullying, not because, let's say, you've boosted your, your, your exports. Mm. You know, your competitiveness on the international market, you know, becomes also uh, a law. So when you look at all these issues, you know, uh, the structural reforms we've done. Mm. For example, till 1989, this government uh, did, some uh, did some structural reforms. Mm. Uh, for example, the civil servants, uh, the number was decreased from 300,000 to 160,000. Uh, the cabinet minister uh, was reduced, uh, the number was reduced from 30 to 22. But we've gone back. That all has been flipped on its side. Yes, we've gone back and even overshoot. That's why today I'm telling you the government is planning to recruit over 10,000 soldiers. We don't need 10 soldiers. Put those people into agriculture sector, mm -hmm. but when you've actually uh, made it favorable, into the agriculture sector, into the industry. Guaranteeing you know. peace is very pertinent for economic development. Absolutely. Every country Absolutely. that uh, uh, sees that. the kind of economic transformation that uh, we've seen in Singapore, America, Europe, the military is steady first, the military is strong and is capable or ready to encounter any threat against the state. That is absolutely right. Mm. I'm not against that. Security is very important. Yeah. We do not take this kind of political stability uh, you know, uh, for granted. But the point is, it shouldn't be the number one priority. Mm. It shouldn't. Ha the, the amount of resources we're allocating to that sector, which is, in economics, we don't actually call it, it's, it's a non-productive sector. Security. For a reason. So in other the military words, is a non-productive sector. Yes. In other words, when you have security and governance, mm. it is more aligned to the political side. And that's where the politics are coming in, as I told you. Mm. You know, it's not about uh, the sector, but how much are we allocating to that sector at the expense oh, of the sectors. productive sector. Allow sectors. me just transition to that uh, aspect, especially when it comes to uh, aiding mass production and uh, including the youth in uh, the kind of uh, plans that uh, government wants. I would like to understand from the budget point of view, the recent reading of the budget, are you happy with the amount of uh, money dedicated to youth initiatives since you're working with the youth and uh, uh, perhaps at the tail end of what is filtering through in terms of resources? Are you happy with the allocations that have been made? Uh, I may not say that I'm happy or uh, I'm satisfied with whatever was passed, mm. but we want to 
do a review. We mm -hmm. need to do a review. Need to do a review. Because the government has come up with so many uh, programs like PIP and uh, I think NDP, the Poverty Eradication Program, mm -hmm. then also the National Development Plan. Uh, you find that uh, according to the uh, to government, I think we are now in phase three mm. of the National Development Plan, uh, which would uh, actually carry us to, as the president was saying, that Uganda is now a middle a status economy, but World Bank is declining, that well, it is the not. Debate, uh, the jury is still out on that. But just take us through what aspects do the youth now need to engage in? Where is the help needed? No. Where are the resources supposed to be powered? effectively because yeah, reviewing me, we might end up reviewing. Uh, to me when i was trying to uh on my question western mm. um, uh, western uh, vice chair person nrm mm. i was trying to advocate so much on skills, skills. like putting up regional or sub-region center skills mm. with all skills giving an example like uh, prisons mm. has really tried like you, when uh, you go into prison, and of course uh, you find uh, you went there minus any skill, someone after some time coming from there, mm. you find he can now make a chair, he can now maybe make an iron box. Eh? So when you, if you can put that money, uh, the funds mm. into send, uh, skills, like you set up center skills, like I have seen it, uh, uh, like in Lira, mm. Uganda Technical College, mm. eh, they are doing better. In so other words, what you're calling for is a more structured rollout of uh, skill centers across the country, yeah, not and, uh, bit part initiatives that every are politically sub you know, inclined. Every sub-region mm. to have at least a center skill, such that if in Ibunyoro, I know that I have a fully fledged a center mm -hmm. uh, co college yeah. that yeah. my children can go and acquire different types of skills. Remember here, we have people who have dropped up to out of the schools as early as P7, mm. as early as senior four, senior six. These people can still be helped in one way or the other, and they can con contribute something to the economy. Okay, very lastly, time is not our best ally right now. Mr. Francis Mahiri, I would like to ask you, what are your parting shots on uh, the way forward with regard to what we are seeing right now in terms of uh, the economy and how best can uh, Ugandans look <laughs> ahead? Uh, for me, this is what I would suggest uh, that where we are right now, mm. a lot of things have gone wrong for a long period of time to the extent that even the system created, you know, that has diffused into the culture and the tradition, that the government need, needs to go to the drawing board mm. and restructure the government. And we are talking about real structural reforms. You know, starting about you know how we allocate resources. Mm. You know, are practicing high levels of fiscal. Uh, uh, fiscal uh, discipline. discipline. I want to tell you, I want to make uh, this point that um, talking about, you know, um, making youth, getting the best out of them, adding value to the GDP. You know, some of the things, uh, for example, the government should stop doing is domestic refinancing. Mm. You know, when you look at domestic refinancing, the returns on the government securities in terms of treasury bills and mm. bonds and is bond. much, much higher. Mm. To the extent that even if an investor wanted to open, let's say, factory that is, let's say, uh, adding value to our locally produced products mm. and give you know, uh, jobs to our youth, mm. they are not going to invest in that. Y when the government securities giving high yields are available and there is no risk. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francis Mahire, an Already economist at 